So good evening, everyone, and good morning, Dr. Rycroft, since it's morning there. My name is Angana Bos, and I am a researcher and a project assistant at TMYS. I welcome you to the stories of tribal identity and culture that will explore the role of tribal literature and tribal representation in literature in shaping cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS review, June 2023, in collaboration with the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives, University of Victoria. We are also calling for the submission of essays, poems, and short stories under the project. To know more about the submission guidelines and the project architecture, please visit www.tellmeastory.biz. This evening, I consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelists, Riti Chatterjee Bose, Dr. Ajit Kumar Pankaj, and Dr. Daniel Rycroft, who will shortly share their views and insights with us. The topic for today's discussion is ethnographic art, socioeconomic development of tribal communities under the subtheme tribal art. So before we dive straight in and begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers without further ado. Our first speaker for the session is Riti Chatterjee Bose. Riti Chatterjee Bose is an artist, art educator, and art therapist. She has a teacher's degree from Manchester Metropolitan University, the United Kingdom, and postgraduate diploma in psychotherapy and counseling from SNHS London, the UK. She is the founder of the art company Artisana, focusing on art lessons and art classes, teaching over 40 plus art forms, art counseling, and exhibition. She's also a published author and poet. Her debut novel, The Unwanted, came out in 2021. She's a mother of two kids and is based in Bhubaneswar, India. We are also delighted to have so, I mean, we are so much delighted to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you for joining us this evening. Next up is our second speaker for the session, Dr. Ajit Kumar Pankaj. Dr. Ajit Kumar Pankaj is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work, Indira Gandhi National Tribal University, Regional Campus Manipur, India. He is the author of Dalit Movements, Assertion, Emancipation, and Social Change, published by Springer International. His research interests cover caste, migration, exclusion, social policy, and community development. He has published several articles in national and international journals like Community Development Journal, Journal of Social Work with Groups, Journal of African and Asian Studies, the American Journal of Economics and Sociology. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the panel, sir. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our third speaker for the session is Dr. Daniel Rycroft. Dr. Daniel J. Rycroft is an associate professor at the University of East Anglia, based in the Department of Art History and World Art Studies. He specializes in Adivasi studies and anthropological history. He is the course director of the Master in Arts in Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies. He is the co-founder of the journal World Art, the founder of UEA's India Dialogue. His most recent book is entitled The Humanities in India as a Pluralist Pedagogy, published by Orion Black Swan, 2023. We are honored to have you on the panel, sir. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now let's move to the heart of the discussion and open the forum for discussion. I would request Riti Bose, ma'am, to share her insights. Ma'am, over to you now. Hi, Yangana. Thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, very good afternoon to uh, Daniel and Ajit Ji. Um, I'm so honored here uh, to be a part of this. Um, although I find it um, slightly, uh, how can I say, unnerving that I'm uh, telling stories that probably uh, do not belong to me. So it's I'm coming from a point of privilege maybe because I've not lived the life uh, and the challenges that go through. But yes, I have worked with... Um, uh, artists who are folk artists and tribal artists and I myself teach tribal art. So um, from whatever limited knowledge I have and whatever I've seen uh, so far, uh, the biggest challenge I face when I work with my folk artist and the tribal artists that I work with is that they often complain that the urban artists are, you know, uh, taking their art form and uh, 
kind of taking inspiration from it and giving it a different version, not sticking to the original um, uh, correct ways of making it. And uh, as a teacher, as a person who is a mediator for sellers and buyers of this art form, it becomes very uh, challenging for me to kind of keep the urban artists away from, uh, you know, venturing into tribal art form and uh, doing fusion work with it. Because often it can be, if you're not properly done, disrespectful. And uh, you are taking away a part of their history and playing around with it. Uh, so it's a dangerous zone for artists like us. Uh, it has to be very ethical when we do that. Um, socioeconomic challenges are, of course, there. Um, I mean, um, starting from the point, who they, do they go to to sell? Very simply put, even not going into you know any kind of um, deep, uh, deeper aspect of it. Who do they approach with their art uh, and uh, handicrafts as well and textiles, not just art. Um, there are government bodies, there are NGOs who are working. Uh, there are people like me in very small scale who are trying to uh, help out as well. But it's not enough. Uh, it's uh, not enough uh, in any way. Uh, we need uh, more funding. We need uh, more uh, people to come out, reach out, buy from the original artists. Uh, maybe, I don't know, the government can. Government, uh, I mean, the state I live in, Odisha, uh, government does have a brand, uh, Vayanika, where they work exclusively with folk and tribal artists to sell their art and textiles. So uh, maybe uh, different state governments can, you know, support the artists who are living in their state. I will stop here because I can go on and on. I would rather uh, hear what Ajit ji and Daniel ji has to kind of uh, give an input to this point. But from an artist's point of view and a teacher and who's uh, dealing with it, this is how I can start off the session. Thank you very much for your insightful observations, ma'am. I would now request Dr. Ajit Kumar Pankaj to share his insights. Sir, the digital floor is all yours now. Sir, you're not uh, audible. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Angna. Uh, and uh, thanks to the organizer who had given me this opportunity to share my experience. Though uh, I have not been uh, closely working with uh, tribal group. However, I have been uh, teaching various courses uh, at university, which is located uh, in a tribal dominated area in order to enhance their educational, uh, to promote the educational education, particularly higher education. Uh, so, well, uh, I will take up from what uh, Riti Chesterji had just uh, shared uh, about the issues and challenges of the art worker. Uh, so, if you see, India possesses a diverse range of uh, traditional business, particularly in the field of art and craft, which showcase a distinctive uh, combination of cultural legacy and economic opportunities. These sectors not only contribute significantly to production and export growth, but they also have a vital role in uh, creating job possibilities, particularly in rural areas, thereby helping to solve economic inequalities. The importance of art and craft in sustenance of tribal group in India cannot be overemphasized. The traditional forms encompasses a variety of uh, material, including common consumer goods, like basket, smoking pipes, and fabrics, as well as more specific objects like wooden and stone plates. The production of these goods frequently entails complex procedures and expert artistry. Furthermore, the incorporation of processing enterprises, which manage significantly forest products, emphasizes the mutually beneficial connection between tribal population and their natural surroundings. This relationship encompasses both economic and cultural aspect as these, product, uh, these, pro uh, these products frequently pro uh, possess profound traditional meanings. So uh, decorative things such as a wide variety of uh, jewels, ornament, artwork have a dual roles as both means of self-expression 
and valuable economic assets in local uh, marketplaces. Local skills, skillfully created object frequently enters larger market, serving a vital source of income for local communities such as tribal groups. Nevertheless, a notable obstacle of uh, obstacles to uh, develop due to inherent economic uncertainty within this industry due to the very poor income generated from traditional craft, numerous indi indigenous artisans are obliged to choose industrial jobs. This transition not only impact the, their financial security, but also presents a danger to the safeguarding of cultural legacy, which they have been carrying out for a long ages. Engaging in crafting uh, on a part-time basis, although providing some relief, is inadequate to maintain the valuable heritage of these talents. The reliance of indigenous people on the handcraft sector uh, underscore a mutual fundamental concern regarding sustainability. The sector's lack of consistency geoparadise their lives, requiring a comprehensive approach to assure both economic uh, stability and cultural preservation. Possible strategy could involve improving market entry, offering skill training and financial assistance and cultivating a stronger, a stronger global recognition and demand for these artisan uh, products. By undertaking this action, it is possible to safeguard the affluent cultural legacy of India's indigenous community while uh, simultaneously guaranteeing their financial autonomy or long-term viability. The complex interplay between tribal culture and handicrafts in India is deeply impacted by modernization. The process of cultural progress, although providing new prospects, uh, which has also resulted in gradual disappearance of the traditional knowledge that used to support the handicraft industries. The issues resides in assuming a harmonious equilibrium between cultural authenticity and the requirement of a contemporary economy. Therefore, the tribal uh, crafts people who are strongly connected to their beliefs and ritual face the risk of losing their traditional means of making a living due to lack of consistent economic opportunity. The volatility, uh, the volatility is worsened by the insufficiency of market support, which is crucial for maintaining any livelihood structure. The state of livelihood system in indigenous group is intricately connected to how their products are marketed and valued in the wider market. The community's creativity and uh, invention are crucial for improving sustainability through marketing strategy. I would just uh, make a few more points to conclude uh, what I have observed uh, in terms of tribal art and crafts. Uh, the sector's survivability is also imposed by restricted opportunities for innovation in production and the absence of resources for repairing and preserving handmade product. Traditional crafting processes, if not adapted to changing market demand, may face challenges in competing with a contemporary mass manufactured product. So in order to sustain uh, uh, tribal art and craft, uh, the organization, government, state, and society shall come together to, to promote uh, uh, the uh, to promote uh, tribal art and craft by providing them uh, uh, marketing strategy, resources, as well as uh, uh, there is also need of awareness uh, particularly among the various uh, communities to promote tribal products, particularly art and craft. So, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sharing your perspectives, that those were very enriching. I would now request Dr. Daniel Rycroft to share his insights. So your turn now. Thank you very much. I'm going to hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation. And I'm going to be I think coming at this both with a personal 
uh, perspective and also to a degree an institutional perspective as well because education sits within uh, different institutions of course and so I think part of our work as academics as learners as researchers is to in a sense develop insights into how and why the institutions we're involved in should respond differently to the Adivasi question um, and by that you know we're thinking about histories of inequality uh, histories of exclusion from some of the mainstream systems and networks and so forth so part of our process is um, needing I think to in a sense decolonize our educational uh, spaces in such a way that the tribal and Adivasi identities, histories, uh, rights and aspirations and so forth can come much more clearly into focus. And so part of our India dialogue work at un the University of East Anglia has been working with Jadavpur University in Calcutta on the question of academic social responsibility, precisely with these uh, decolonization objectives in mind. One of the things about decolonization, though, is that it means different things to different people and requires different um, practices to ensue in different locations. It's not a uniform project. And this is why, you know, the, the network of, broadly speaking, decolonizing agendas across India uh, needs to be brought together so that we can learn critically uh, from each other and think about, you know, perhaps how and why the, uh, the operation uh, requires sort of local and regional uh, distinctiveness. And with that, I think, you know, we can also ask questions of what we're talking about here, which is development, because of course, development means, um, again, many different kinds of things in accordance with what aspect of development we're talking about. Is it human development? Is it economic? Is it political? Is it a national level? Is it a at a community level? And so the, the dynamics of development are, are quite uneven um, and even across you know what we're talking about here which is the range of Adivasi and tribal communities and contexts in India the attitudes towards development may vary very very much you know there may be on the one hand a real resistance to in a sense the leverage the leveraging of development discourses by the nation state if it's seen to be you know uh, a means to continue various forms of exploitation. Whereas, as we've just heard, sustainable development or a community focused or even rights based development process may mean something very, very different and, and uh, of course, lead to really good levels of, of empowerment and uh, justice. So it's a complex arena, of course, I wanted to share a few words around visual ethnography, because this is you know, my entry point into the space spaces of ethnography, because I think we can learn a lot from uh, the history of visual ethnography. It's changed uh, through the decades. The relationships have changed. The technologies have changed. Uh, the role and purpose of ethnography has changed, um, really from anything like the mid 19th century all the way through the 20th century into the 21st century. So it's going to be interesting to think about the futures of ethnography, of visual ethnography, again, through the 21st century um, and beyond, because visual communication is very powerful. It can be, you know, um, a really good way for people to understand issues, uh, documentary films and so forth can be really interesting. Um, in themselves and uh, a really good way for stories you know to be uh, shared so tell me your story it was basically the the premise of one of the film documentaries i worked on uh, back in around 2004 2005 uh, it, it it became the film documentary marking the two the sorry 150th anniversary of the santal rebellion or the hul of uh, 1855 to 18 56. And as I said, the premise of that film really was to encourage descendants of Sidhu and Kanu Murmu, who were the uh, main uh, Santal freedom fighters of the Santal rebellion, to engage their perspectives on both that historical event, if we can call it that, 
plus also the ramifications of that event, as well as the memories of that event. Because there's a lot of what we call memory work going on in places like Jharkhand, in places affected by this rebellion, uh, whether through performance, poetry, uh, various rituals and so forth, as well as statue work. Uh, and so that film highlights the place. Uh, it highlights how that place and its um, capacity to sort of articulate those memories uh, evolves and how it emerges in today's society. So that's part of the story. The, her the political heritage is part of the story that's being told alongside the uh, historical narratives. Um, okay, so I think, you know, probably just one more kind of little area I wanted to cover in these opening remarks, um, which is around the role of the nation state in the kind of reception of these, of these narratives, if you like, and the role of what might be referred to as non-Adivasis uh, in, in this reception and interpretation process. Uh, because, again, part of the story isn't singularly about Adivasi culture. Of course, that's very important, but it's also about the capacity for non-Adivasis, in the sense, to rethink their relationship with these traditions, with these narratives, with these ideologies, or whatever it is that is um, emerging from a more clearly delineated space of uh, Adivasi hood, if you like. So I've written a chapter in this book, Humanities in India as Pluralist Pedagogy, on the non-Adivasi, the concept of the non-Adivasi, and how that is also potentially a rights-based position, just as being Adivasi is, because being Adivasi is premised on both national rights as well as human rights, uh, as well as cultural rights. And of course, all these things have, in their beginning, uh, a much longer history, you know, in some ways, back, you know, even perhaps before the 20th century in some cases, but certainly in the Indian context through national decolonization, these things came very much to the foreground in the interwar years, as well as in the independence and partition years, and uh, just after, of course, with the writing of the, the constitution, which is a product of this rights-based thinking. Um, and it's the product of a rights-based rights -based thought process inhabited and and driven mainly by non-Adivasis, not, not necessarily by non-Adivasi interests, but certainly the Adivasi voice in the constitution writing process was at best uh, minimal. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there are clear and important footholds for the uh, Adivasi claim uh, and, and set of claims in the constitution, which is of course why it's so important to keep that you know, front and center uh, in many ways. So what does this mean in terms of visual representation? Well, if we think back to the late 1930s, the Indian National Congress held its uh, National Congress in Jharkhand in a place called Ranga. And the visual artist Upendra Maharati developed a very beautiful pencil drawing of the freedom fighter Birsa Munda, who's of course very well known and his story is, of course, also very well known in terms of its significance to the um, rights of contemporary Adivasis. And his pencil drawing was inspired by, or kind of in visual terms, shaped by an early, earlier photograph of Birsamunda uh, in captivity, but with a degree of kind of insight, you could say. He, he liberates that um, image. He liberates also the figure within the image, um, Birsamunda, and he liberates the iconography to the extent that we see in his pencil drawing somebody who has many kind of, if you like, different human qualities, uh, not just the quality of the insurgent, but also the quality of the leader or the prophet or the healer. Uh, and uh, that's a very interesting kind of visual process that went on in the late 1930s. And it's also very significant to note that he, produced that portrait with the intention of giving it to Mahatma Gandhi. And so we have kind of historical evidence that Gandhi took on board this image of Birsa Munda, had some sort of developed some kind of relationship with it. And I think that is very telling because it's really helping us understand this capacity for 
in that case, the Congress, but more broadly speaking, we can say non adivasis the capacity of non adivasis to, to, to understand uh, Adivasi kind of histories and ethos, uh, you know, in a way that makes sense to them, as well as to the Adivasis being represented, so that some kind of, you know, intercultural coexistence can occur and some kind of um, solidarity even uh, might occur. And of course, to suggest that the Indian National Congress and India's Adivasis are on the same page, that's not necessarily a strong narrative. It may be historically accurate in some contexts, uh, but of course there are tensions um, there. Um, so all I'm really trying to do is just to sort of think about like what this space is uh, between the the kind of the rights-based uh, drive of many Adivasi organizations across India. What development, if any, discourses are part and parcel of that Adivasi drive and then you know what what that might mean to people who have a different social identity perhaps a different um set of uh learning experiences perhaps they reside in in, in um, you know urban centers where the adivasi presence isn't necessarily characterized by territoriality or anything like that so you know what what it means to people kind of if you like outside of the adivasi mainstream um because I think you know we need to think of that in 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 self-reflective of ways, uh, and of course literature is a good way of doing that. So many good ways of, of doing that, and dialogue, of course, is uh, where it needs to come to. Because um, you know we all want to share our readings of things, we all want to share our uh, experiences, and I've really seen in the last five ten years a real kind of upturn in um, the. Uh, Kind of urgency with, with with which this point uh, is being made by Adivasi writers and uh, activists. Okay, so thank you very much for your valuable observation, sir. Uh, moving on, uh, we will now transition to the engaging question and answer session. We'll begin with the first panelist. So we have a question for Riti, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, as an art mentor and counselor. How would you trace the evolution of ethnographic art within tribal communities, influencing their socioeconomic development? And what role does it play in shaping their cultural identity and heritage? OK, um, so um, Angana, uh, if I try and pick out all art forms, it would be difficult. So I will pick one example, say, for the Warli tribe. Okay, and let's me let me give an example through that tribe's art form evolution. Okay, so there are seven hundred plus tribes uh, uh, in India, uh, so it is very difficult to pinpoint the exact way because every type tribe would have their own, you know, story of evolution and what they have gone through, the socio-cultural impact. So when we look at the Warli tribe, that art form itself is about uh, two thousand five hundred years old. Uh, so um, when initially, uh, much like, you know, cave paintings, it was done on the walls. And then obviously, once they became the tribes, became more pastoral society, they started farming, they started settling down, the uh, paintings shifted to the walls of their huts. Now, uh, if you look at worldly painting, or Varli, uh, whichever way you would like to pronounce it, um, you will see it's a direct depiction of their daily life. Now, in the 1970s, up till that point of time, there was no um, sort of way for them to translate that art into something commercial and earn money from it. So in 1970s, Sir Jivya Soma Masi, who's a part of that community, he's a tribal, he's a tribal artist, sadly, Sir passed away in 2018. He's considered the modern father of early painting. So he was the first person to kind of transfer those beautiful art forms from the walls onto canvas and print. So, and then his son now, Balu Masse, he is also doing it. And uh, Varli tribe is based off Thane near uh, in Maharashtra, very close to Mumbai. So they also had that access to uh, the audience in Mumbai, the people who were willing to see. So now Varli tribal art is possibly one of the most popular and most commercialized, if I, uh, for the lack of a better term. Um, now, 
all, it was all good to a certain point of time because the tribal artists were getting an exposure. They were getting a means of earning. Now enter urban artists. So what has happened is whatever evolution was happening, suddenly uh, the money that was going into uh, the actual artists were making it has kind of split up. There, uh, although there is a GI tag given, geographical indication given by government of India, copyright issues, intellectual property rights, nobody follows up. Uh, uh, like taking direct references and doing and selling uh, uh, by different artists from different communities happen. There is a, another tribe called the Sara tribe, which is in Orissa. Uh, their art form is very similar to Vagri, but the way you make it is completely different. Uh, Sara has a more metric, uh, you know, rhythmic feel to it, whereas Varli is more um, random. Uh, color choices are limited in Varli, whereas in Sara we use a lot of colors. So a lot of people started making Sara and selling it in the name of Varli because that had already been popularized. So uh, as an art mentor, as somebody... Uh, uh, it's also not only a part of my job to, you know, help people also to counsel them. Can I, you know, you are, you have to be strong and you have to be very careful who you're sharing your art with, especially this tribal um, artist. They're so, uh, uh, how can I say, they're very innocent at heart. So they will share their work. People take photographs of their work and take back and make their own versions. So and there is uh, the evolution that was happening, the transition that was happening uh, quite smoothly up till some point of time. I think the enter of social media and the digital digitalization of many things has made it far more challenging for the tribal artists because, you know, you could simply go to a, a village uh, uh, in Orissa and pick a pic of uh, Sora art and just come back and do something with it and without the artist even getting any recognition or payment for it. So how do we stop that? Um, I'm, uh, I mean, I know uh, uh, Dr. Daniel and Dr. Ajit are talking at a much larger scale. I'm talking at the very grassroots level, you know, at the, uh, going down to the very basics. How do we stop the simple things? Bigger things I know a lot of people are talking about, a lot of work is being done. But the smaller uh, problems that uh, we fa we are facing right now, I don't know. Um, and the um, practices that the unethical practices that happen right in front of your eyes. I I want to name one particular brand, but I don't want to because I don't want to get sued. Um, there is this one very famous Indian brand who make ethnic stuff. Okay, I'll tell you later. I'm gonna. I'll not say it up on the live. So um, they give 200 rupees, 300 rupees to this artist to take photos of their work. And then they go back and uh, print on furnishings, cushion covers. So can you imagine? And they sell it for thousands and thousands of rupees in bulk. So how are, I mean, talking about evolution and all is wonderful. We can see evolution has happened and things are getting better. I will not be a pessimist on the panel, but um, uh, things are getting better. The work is being done, but uh, there is also a very dark side. The constant uh, manipulation, the constant taking advantage of people, of the tribal people, of the tribal community is still a uh, uh, truth. It's it's not gone away. Uh, and uh, I myself being a sovereign, I'm very ashamed of that fact that people who are like uh, Daniel rightly said, the non adivasi community must be also aware they need to, you know, be a participant in this entire evolution process to understand, to show empathy. And that is not there still. Uh, uh, and but if you look at their art forms, if I go to the technicality of the art forms, Varli tribe has kept their art form still very much so as they used to make their original ethnographic art. The version is completely pretty much the same. Whereas Sora tribe has started including technology. So you can see, you know, little drawings of laptops or mobiles uh, in their art. So every tribe has a different way of adapting and accepting uh, the changes that is happening around them. So. This is, I think, a very open-ended question, and I've said answer that goes all over the place. But I hope uh, it addresses a little something that you tried to ask me.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for laying the groundwork. That was very important. And thank you for sharing your insights on that. Uh, now, when we move to the second panelist, Dr. Ajit uh, Kumar Pankaj. You have discussed tribal exclusion and insecurity in some of your scholarly articles. From an economic standpoint, how do ethnographic art and craft industries impact the livelihoods and income generation of tribal communities? And what strategies can be implemented to ensure a sustainable market for their artistic products? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Angna. Uh, so, well, uh, what I have done uh, in my uh, uh, base first uh, basic discussion, uh, I have tried to highlight how, how the 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 tri tribal art and crafts uh, is facing uh, biggest issues, uh, particularly in terms of uh, making it as an enterprise uh, or, or making it as a source of livelihood. So uh, what I would uh, highlight now, uh, based on the question with, which you uh, just highlighted, I think the first part of the question is being already discussed uh, when I started the discussion. So uh, more over, uh, not focusing much on uh, uh, issues rather than I focus now on uh, the process uh, or the way to ensure tribal livelihood. Uh, so if you see uh, uh, the lack of uh, efficient communication routes for uh, indigenous craftsmen to obtain information regarding government policies and program significantly hamper their capacity to adjust and prosper. We have seen there are uh, ample of uh, government program as well, like uh, for instance, a trifid. But uh, how many tribal groups are aware about that kind of opportunity uh, so uh, that is uh, a kind of uh, one example. So uh, what uh, I feel the lack of communication and support from uh, uh, NGO working in the, in the field, uh, particularly uh, to enhance their tribal livelihood, uh, have a, a limited uh, exposure or one can say uh, limited uh, capacity to, to promote uh, or to create such awareness and develop a dialogue, initiate a communication to promote what government has been doing, what NGO can do uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to promote their sustainable livelihood, uh, uh, to, to promote and generate sustainable livelihood model for this uh, craftsman. Further, the viability of uh, tribal uh, handicraft is uh, additionally undermined by the younger generation transition to other economic prospect and their limited availability of raw material. Furthermore, the individual craftsmen frequently lack adequate storage facilities for their items, which has a deter detrimental impact on both quality and marketability of their crafts. If you can see, uh, hardly the tribal community and the people uh, having a, a big storage capacity. So they produce in a small quantity, they sell in a small quantity that is also somehow affecting its sustainability if they're not able to store because in on certain period of time, the, the demand of such product is high, but if the production is less, that there is a gap. Furthermore, the lack of link between the craftsman and mainstream society and marketplace result in insufficient marketing assistance. This factor together with the scarcity of raw material and absence of regular employment lead to reduced pay and unstable economic situation in the handicraft industry, which are largely uh, owned by a tribal community. So in order to bridge this gap, it is necessary to focus in focused individual to combine traditional craftsmen, uh, uh, traditional craftsmanship with a contemporary commercial tactics to guaranteeing the uh, conservation of cultural heritage and the economic empowerment of tribal group. Uh, so uh, 
there is also uh, one issue which i would like to uh, highlight here fluctuation uh, in demand for handicrafts and the accessibility of raw material are greatly influenced by seasonal changes especially during the rainy season so the shift in season presents a significant obstacle to ensuring a stable income for tribal crafts people consequently impacting the overall sustainability of their livelihood so therefore when we are talking about sustaining the uh, the livelihood of tribal uh, uh, craftsmen we need to uh, focus on this issue so that we can ensure the sustainable livelihood thank you thank you sir and i appreciate your eye for detail towards sustainability of such practices uh, moving on we'll move to our third panelist that is dr daniel rycroft i would like to ask you sir that drawing from uh, your personal teaching experience how has the theory of art history of ancient tribal india contributed to the socio economic empowerment of tribal artisans and their communities and how have these art forms enabled the preservation of indigenous knowledge and skills over generations great uh, thank you angana and what a great question um I think it boils down to this concept of heritage and uh, how different people are invested in certain kinds of heritage work, you could say. Um, so specifically in relation to Jharkhand and the uh, rather early aesthetics of uh, today's Adivasi's forebears, so their ancestors, there's been some really good work done by the organization called Sanskriti. Uh, which is headed up by Bulu Imam. Uh, and uh, over there in the Harzari Bag, they have um, put or done a lot of work to nurture what is called the Women's Artists Cooperative, which is about developing a market uh, internationally for uh, Jharkhand's uh, female Adivasi artists uh, across different Adivasi communities. And so they work cooperatively and have been significant in developing a series of, you could say, kind of aesthetic categories uh, for the different kinds of artwork that, that pertain to their artistic uh, heritage. And that's been quite neatly internationalized across the India-Australia relationship with lots of good cooperative work going on between Jharkhand's Adivasi women artists and Australia's uh, indigenous artists. So if we're talking about ethnography, I'm very interested in the fact that even though Bulu has written some interesting kind of theories around Jharkhand's antiquity in terms of its, its aesthetics, we also have an ethnography developing in the very making of these artworks and in the very making of that um, cooperative. It's not a textual ethnography, it's a social one. It's one that is written through the correspondence between these people, their capacity to work together, and so on. Um, so I'm, again, kind of drawing upon what I was talking about a little earlier, which is the role of these organizations, for example, educational organizations, artistic and heritage organizations, to get on board with the responsibilities and also the possibilities that emerge as and when they become non adivasi when they become actively in a relationship with an adivasi tradition so i'm not using the term non adivasi just as a social signifier by saying you're not something i'm saying it's a productive space of becoming uh, whether through increased knowledge uh, different kinds of uh, intercultural awareness or intercultural skills and it comes about in the count of one's relationship differently calibrated relationship with adivasi activists or adivasi artists or adivasi storytellers or adivasi educators or whoever so we can draw interesting parallels not only do we have bulu and uh, these artists we had a little earlier of the wali art and jivya's work and so we can think of arvind gulsaka and his work as the um kind of exponent of W-A-R-L-I, so WALI, the acronym, uh, his work there is all about, um, you know, sustaining that uh, interest in the WALI aesthetics in Gujarat. We can also, of course, think about the relationship between Jangar Singh Shyam and Swaminathan uh, and the active 
you know, work Swaminathan did in central India to, to create a better understanding of um, the, the Parangon artistic uh, heritages and stories, and also aesthetic and artistic potential. Um, so we've mentioned Bulu, we've mentioned Arvind, we've mentioned Swaminathan. They are all ethnographers in a sense because they are producing these relationships. They're developing the, um, the art and the aesthetics and the understanding. And just finally then, I would come on to the role of artists in this same process. So for example, I've mentioned Maharati. There's also, of course, Nandalal Bose uh, based at Shantini Ketan, where he produced on the library building a mural or uh, depicting a Santal Adivasi woman developing her mural. So it's a, a modern artwork of a so-called traditional subject but really interesting artistic kind of correspondences between the modern artist, namely Nandalal, and the indigenous or Adivasi artist. And he's not trying to exoticize, he's not trying to romanticize. All he's saying is, look, just look at what these people do in terms of their own making. I'm, so again, I'm kind of quoting what he might be thinking, Nandalal, like, all I'm doing is, is is looking at this process and reflecting upon that process and building it into my own artistic work. And so his art then lent itself to the, the mural making in, in uh, Patabhavan in, in Shantini Ketan. And so you have this immediate correspondence between that building at that university, Vishwabharati, and the surrounding Santal architecture. So it's like a, a close correspondent, an aesthetic correspondence, one that does lots of interesting kind of recalibration in terms of unsettling the hierarchical relationship between modern art and pre-modern art or whatever. It's trying to create an equal setting. So with that then, you know, we can think afresh about the, these relationships, about art, kind of art and ethnography, and also come to an understanding of the Adivasi, or in this case, Santal, input into the world making process of Vishwabharati now as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yeah, as recently Shantini Ketan landscape with all the buildings and all of that was inscribed onto the UNESCO World Heritage List. And of course, it's primarily about Rabindranath Tagore and his, his philosophy, his legacy, his community building. But part of the very being of Shantini Ketan is the relationship with the landscape and therefore the, the capacity for these buildings and for their teaching also to respond differently to the local, uh, in this case, Santal uh, aesthetics and issues. Thank you, sir, for exemplifying art and uh, by drawing very interesting parallels. So moving on, we also move to our first panelist again. Uh, Riti, ma'am, being a social entrepreneur yourself, could you provide insights into the societal significance of specific ethnographic art forms in different tribal communities? And how have these art forms traditionally contributed to the economic well-being of these groups? Okay. Um, uh, when I'm speaking, Angana, uh, you must uh, be aware that I'm speaking from uh, my limited experience. And I not only work with tribal art, I work with uh, folk art as well, and primarily with women artists. So my perspective is going to be from that uh, point. So um, uh, first of all, I do not like to call myself a social entrepreneur. I'm no way an entrepreneur in any form. I'm just uh, someone who's trying, who loves art um, and trying to do something about it, something good about it. So. Um, so whenever um, I have had little opportunity to work with women artists uh, in and around my community where I live in Bhuvneshwar, Orissa, and in some parts of West Bengal where I belong from, um, the primary thing I have noticed, uh, talking from the female artists' perspectives, uh, is that uh, women are more uh, open to learning uh, they uh, want to adapt to the modern means where it, the work becomes easier for them. 
so it also becomes a challenge when they want to deviate from the original ways of making the so now they have access to acrylic paint they have access to canvases uh, they want to portray uh, uh, our, you know uh, going through the hassle of creating all those natural colors collecting pigments making the dyes uh, it takes a lot it's it's a long process so um, whereas if they can create uh, an, uh, a version of what they have with easier materials, they are able to make, make it in bulk, uh, number one. So uh, it's a, do you want to uh, kind of keep the original uh, authentic versions and make lesser number of art, which gives them less like uh, Dr. Rajit very uh, uh, rightly pointed out, they do not have space to store them. And they do not have the means uh, to, you know, even take this uh, to other places. So they obviously make in small amounts. But now with the change of time, now I've completely forgotten what question do you ask me, Angona. I'm just going on my own. Okay, please forgive me for that. I have a habit of doing that. Uh, so, um, so um, as a person who want to kind of keep the original, uh, the ethnic versions, so when I look at work of uh, Bhuri Bhai uh, for uh, civil art, or you know, if you look at Sita Devi's work, uh, it 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 is so beautiful because they are made in the original versions. So now people, the uh, prospective uh, clients or customers who would like to buy, they are demanding original versions, but uh, the artists are not able to uh, produce similar amounts. Uh, we do not have enough number of young people interested in the ethnographic art forms to, you know, keep learning. So um, there are many forms which are dying down uh, and very soon they'll only become, you know, part of history books and there will not be enough artists who are carrying those, uh, you know, legends forward, those history forward. So um, uh, the situation is difficult. Um, like uh, Daniel very rightly said that there are places like Shantiniketan and uh, other universities who are uh, doing, academics are doing, researchers are stepping in. Um, uh, it is a very uh, wonderful uh, change for people like us who are at the very base, uh, small scale. So um, also at this point of time, I would really like to thank uh, Daniel and Ajit for doing whatever you are doing. It helps us in some way. Uh, so. Um, as a person who is into, I, I want to see the commercialization of ethnographic art. I want to see the evolution, but in a more uh, uh, ethical way. And I think I'm just going round and round now because I am stuck in that loop. My head is always in that loop only. So I'll just not take up more of your time and stop here and I'll uh, pass the mantle to Ajit and Daniel from here on. And I'll just listen. I'm gonna, I think you're on mute. Okay. So I was just carried away with your <laughs> wonderful insights, ma'am. And so I forgot to turn the mic on. Okay, so moving on to Dr. Ajit, I wanted to know, and I was very curious throughout your uh, research experience, how do you think can the integration of traditional ethnic communities into modern societal framework contribute to the empowerment of tribal artisans and entrepreneurs? And what are the potential avenues for scaling up their businesses while preserving their cultural heritage? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Angna. Uh, and I think uh, the, the Riti had already provided a lot of insights. Uh, 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 I will just uh, extend uh, uh, her uh, points. See, uh, if you see uh, uh, the state of tribal art uh, in India necessitates a uh, comprehensive and all-encompassing strategy from the Indian government uh, with a focus on safeguarding and incorporating tribal groups. If you see there are various policy to safeguard uh, the tribal interest as well. The, the modification of the draft uh, national policy on tribal is a significant measures that aimed at recognizing and tackling the distinct obstacle 
encountered by the tribal communities an impact of uh, uh, impactful and uh, efficient national tribal policy would not only uh, alone prioritize the advancement of tribes but also requires modification in other departments ministries uh, in order to harmonize different uh, facets of economic policy to more effectively cater to tribal requirement the varied artistic expression of india's indigenous community constitute, constitute uh, an indispensable component of the nation's uh, abundant cultural legacy however these creative forms face uh, imminent danger as a result of numerous issues such as uh, land depletion and obstacle in assimilating into the dominant culture we have seen there are a number of uh, attempt has been taken out uh, in order to assimilate tribal identity within a particular frame i would not name those frame here uh, so as a result of these circumstances there has been a decline in the number of tribal artist and uh, a disregard of tribal folk culture as well so a government and non government organization are ex ex uh, exciting admirable uh, endeavors to conserve and uh, advance tribal art uh, acknowledging its uh, significance as a cultural gem nevertheless this present the conundrum uh, of commercialization although commercialization is a crucial for the preservation and a broader acknowledgement of tribal art it also has the potential of diminishing the genuine essence and liveliness that render this art form distinctive the the task at hand is uh, to achieve a harmonious equilibrium in which tribal art can be commodified without compromising its uh, intrinsic nature and reducing it to a mere commodity uh, so i would uh, make few more points to respond uh, to your question uh, in addition to this the tribal art of india is renowned for its inherent originality uncomplicated nature and profound expression characteristics that have served as a source of inspiration for contemporary artistic both within india and globally so the ethnic and simplistic it bright and colorful nature of india's cultural ref Uh, india's culture reflects its rich cultural background preserving this craft is essential not just for sustaining the economic well-being of tribal group but also for safeguarding a, a crucial aspect of india's cultural heritage so with these points i would hand over uh, to uh, daniel <laughs> yes thank you you gave us ample food for thought Now moving on to uh, the next panelist's question, I would like to ask Dr. Rycroft that uh, now whenever we are talking about this particular thing, for example, from okay, I would like to put it this way: How do you envision the future trajectory of socio-economic development within tribal communities like Kerala in Jharkhand, considering the role and significance of preserving and promoting the mural aesthetics? Thank you, Angina. Um, I think the mural aesthetics can feature. Um, by mural aesthetics, we're talking about, in the Adivasi context, predominantly. women's attitudes to ritual landscape folklore transmission transmission of values development of voice and so forth um so we're thinking about the role of the home within the society the role of women and girls within the society uh which is potentially something that can be brought into SDG 5 so the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and all of the subscribers to that program uh which focuses on the empowerment of women and girls um so in terms of my envisaging of the future it would need to any kind of program that would would feature these aesthetics would need to also foreground 
the work of that program in that kind of empowerment, gendered empowerment process. That might then require people of the community, so people whose mural aesthetics are being considered here, to articulate their sense of myth and history and identity and society and all of these things, which of course, when we think about it in terms of Adivasi aesthetics are all interconnected. I mean, the very term you use, Kerawal, is a belief-centered term on how people in basically the Santal and Munda and related communities see themselves as being born from the kind of primordial egg. Um, so that's a myth. It's a creation myth, but it's also a story. So it's part of telling of the story is also telling of the myth telling of the positions that ascertain to that myth in terms of social positions and so forth. Um, I think it also, of course, if it's about socioeconomic development needs to be future centered. So the, the, the future is also told in a certain way that perhaps can incorporate these aesthetics. So it's a complex, a very, very complex question, but and I don't think it's been done too much before, namely the combination of mural aesthetics and socioeconomic development, but I think it probably can. So one other reflection, if I may, which is about then how we develop our insights into the relationship between myth and history, or between kind of mythic time and real time, or between past and future, which are very important sort of heritage questions to consider. Um, there is some guidelines on the need for people across the world to, of course, preserve what, what UNESCO calls cultural landscapes. And I think that's kind of also what we're talking about here, which isn't just the art form itself, but it's also the ecology of that art form. Um, so I think, you know, when we're talking about Adivasi cultural landscapes, it becomes perhaps a more interesting question than one necessarily than just about murals, although as I've tried to be, as I've tried to say, they're sort of part and parcel of each other. But a cult, an Adivasi cultural landscape invites an, a question about how the Adivasis participate in the making of this landscape. Like, not only from an ecological point of view, but also from a political point of view. Um, because, you know, if we're talking about Adivasi landscapes, we're probably talking about areas of India that are classified under the constitution in terms of the fifth schedule, okay? Which is to do with the significance of the Adivasi inhabitation of that place, yeah? And the capacity for the nation state in this context to respect those histories and those stories and those experiences and what have you, because they're all they're all abstracted in terms of Schedule Five, the fifth schedule, but they're all real, very very real, of course, in terms of people's lives, people's memories, people's aspirations, people's identities, and people's rights and so forth. So, yes, I mean the cultural landscape idea is is perhaps one that may have more longevity. You know, if we're if we're having a conversation here about how to address a whole set of issues, I would probably try and encourage people to organize their work around the cultural landscape theme rather than around the mural aesthetics scheme, although I would want to see one feeding into the other. Um, I would also just encourage one other point, which is to think about how the or what impact the uh, introduction of these ideas or of these relationships have in relation to the community's sense of, of itself. Um, and so it, tell me your story is a, a, a great kind of tagline, of course, but of course the most important stories would never get answered if you physically ask the question, you know, or, or invited that response, tell me your story. Because yes, you get some stories, but you probably wouldn't get the, the, the perhaps the more interesting ones or the um, the more relevant ones to the question. It would be like an immediate response. So as I've been saying, it's really about how the relationship nurtures the answer to the question or how the relationship 
becomes, as we've heard from the previous speakers, about mutual benefit um, and so on. So I think that then is potentially transformative because if that process is actually empowering in the ways that we anticipate that it might be, it would probably transform not only the relationships, but also the sense of selfhood within any given society or within any given culture. And it's, it's really, you know, that point which interests me most is how people's sense of themselves changes to the extent that we need to be aware of potentially some kind of refresh or some kind of update around all the terminology we use and so forth, because, you know, it's, it's both a little bit dated and also a little bit inaccurate in terms of the, um, some of the terminology around these identities. Uh, you know, if we're using these so-called kind of ethnic labels, that's sometimes problematic. We need to perhaps, if we are thinking about local nuances and local experience, we need to really use perhaps much more localized vocabulary and understand why we're using that and, and, and give kind of, if you like, a proper platform for the Adivasi self articulation. That's really what I think I would want to argue for. Thanks, Angela. Yes, sir. So it's actually very nuanced. It's uh, full of heterogeneity. So in that case, it's thank you for unpacking the, the essence of it and bringing the epistemology to the fore. Uh, now, moving on to the next panelist and the next question. This is a very favorite question of mine. Uh, Ma'am, from an author's perspective, what do you think are the key challenges faced by tribal communities in maintaining their art practices? And how can collaborations with governmental and non-governmental organizations help in promoting the socioeconomic development and cultural preservation of these communities? Angara, don't you think I've already answered that in the last yes, question? I have already said yes. that. So um, I'll just keep it brief because we are also yes. running short of time. Um, I think um, rather than the challenges, let's now uh, kind of move on to the solutions. What can we do? And um, as um, somebody who writes a little this well, um, whenever uh, you are writing a story um, it becomes you you unless you have lived that experience uh, it you it, it has to be a imagination so the imagination is also based on something right and as urban writers we do not have i mean as a, a, a little girl growing up in india i hardly knew about the tribes let alone know their stories uh, it was much later in university or in college when uh, you know uh, i was uh, studying literature that's when uh, they came in so over the years it has been a learning experience and i hope that our children uh, throughout india are you know are a lot more history is only it, it cannot be about the colonial period and the mughal era uh, the schools should start very early on uh, teach tribal history so that by the time they reach adulthood they are aware they are interested in tribal art they are interested in visiting the places seeing the people tourism can help uh, in uh, in you know uplifting whatever challenges uh, the people are facing um, another thing is you know uh, it has to be cool somebody has to the fashion designers the social media can you know whoever is creating all this they need to make tribal art folk art cool so that it's more accessible to the youth and i believe the power lies in the youth it's not about you know middle-aged people like us we are not cool anymore we cannot do much about it but the younger generation has that power so you know uh, uh, once it is uh, acceptable it is something you know you want to do you want to be a part of uh, and it, it's never it's it, it's not anymore them and us us and them uh it's uh, our stories our um, and it, it it can't be that generalized i know i i sound very childish when i say that but um, when that divide of them and us uh, kind of shortens i think that's when we can overcome the challenges it's still at this point of time is uh, we cannot be the we cannot think of ourselves as the saviors it's so uh, uh, bad <laughs> in a way uh, uh, we are at the same platform and we have to approach these challenges and solutions as if we are on the same 
uh, platform you know then only maybe some changes can be made not we cannot be thinking from up here and looking down there that is i think the worst possible way to solve uh, the problems uh, and i think that has been this is the biggest challenge because whenever uh, organizations and uh, high people high up in power are trying to help they are not trying to help their peers they are trying to help, you know they are looking down and trying to uplift something and i think that is the problem if that makes sense <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It definitely does because uh, you know your solutions are very doable. They are very viable. Okay, they can be put into practice. Okay, so yes. So, and then, and uh, I, I, I would also like to apologize uh, to both Daniel and Ajit for being this literal. I, I wish I, I had enough, you know, a, a background in academics like you do. to uh, put more insightful thoughts into it but as you can tell already that i am a, a passionate woman with very limited experience so uh, all my words are coming from that place no but your insights are really uh, <clears throat> meaningful for us to uh, get the ground reality thank you ajit that's yeah. very nice of you thank you thank you ma'am Yes, and uh, sir, Dr. Ajit, sir, uh, some of your works mention the implications of the pandemic on the group solidarity and the migrant life of the Dalits. How can tribal communities leverage market trends to achieve inclusive socio-economic growth and sustainable development post-pandemic? Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you, Angna. Uh, see, uh, being a second panelist, there is always uh, advantage. so uh, most of the point uh, some of the points have been already said by uh, briti so uh, that probably make my job a little easier uh, so however uh, i would cite uh, an example from manipur uh, which is my workplace as well uh, in manipur particularly if you see uh, in each locality there is a uh, if the locality is uh, tribal dominated locality there is a tribal women uh, vendors and uh, to uh, sell out their product particularly art craft to the uh, ample of products are there so for that uh, they have a specific place that is called uh, bazaar or market and it's been by uh, it's been developed by the community and uh, also government has also built up uh, a big market even you may be surprised to know uh, asia's biggest women market Uh, are available in Imphal. Uh, only women are allowed to sell the product. However, anyone can get the or buy the product. So, uh, what happens in the pandemic? The COVID nineteen pandemic significantly affected the means of subsistence subsistence for urban tribal women vendors, especially those conducted business. Uh, those who were conducting their business in prominent market complex that are that were built by the. community itself or sometime by state so uh, the lockdown tactics resulted in the closure of these market places which are vital for the economic and social connection of numerous tribal women this scenario under is cause a more extensive concern regarding the sustainability and adaptability of marginalized people particularly in times of emergency however i would not focus much on the problem because we all uh, know how it has happened however i would uh, much uh, i would focus on um, solution to overcome such problems it is necessary to make a focused and determined attempt to establish and enhance collective unity among tribal communities although there is a feeling of uh, uh, camaraderie inside individual tribal grouping it is crucial to cultivate a more encompassing sense of cohesion in a very tribal group because if you see uh, there are number of tribal group if there is a solidarity that solidarity remains with a specific tribal group not tribal as a whole unity so enhanced solidarity across tribal group has the potential to facilitate more efficient collective effort and to booster support structure hence enhancing the resilience of this group in the event of future crisis promoting unity among tribes can be achieved through the establishment of communication and cooperation platforms 
the encouragement of joint efforts for economic and social progress and support of policies that cater to the specific requirement of tribal communities. Though the establishment of robust network of assistance and cooperation, indigenous community can enhance their resilience in the face of adversities such as pandemic and strive toward achieving sustainable development and self-determination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. They were very interesting points put out to the fore. Now, moving on uh, to the last question before closing this session, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Daniel Rycroft, from an art historian's point of view, uh, what is your take on colonial and post-colonial ethnographic art as rethinking entities and reworking concepts of history through remembrances? OK, so. Just a very brief reflection, if I may, on, on Ajit's point around, you know, concepts of tribal unity. I think it's a really interesting proposition. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it goes back to one of the earlier points I was suggesting, which is the social responsibility of universities and academics, in a sense, to do whatever they can uh, to create these pathways for unity. Because one of the, you know, if talking about colonial and post-colonial, one of the impact of colonialism was, of course, to not foster collaboration or cooperation between, in our case, India's Adivasi communities, uh, or in a much broader sense, between you know India's citizenry. Uh, that, of course, was one of the main objectives of the Indian National Congress, in a sense, was to build cooperation and build solidarity and what have you. Um, so. The search for unity, the search for solidarity, the search for cooperation is, in a, in a sense, a form of decolonization. Um, and it's interesting that we're having this conversation now in relation to India's Adivasi communities, because some would argue that uh, the 70, 80 years since independence, decolonization has not necessarily been too pr a prominent. Uh, phenomenon for for adivasis um so with that then you know come comes into play a certain set of of, of issues and and possibilities in terms of the uh the solidarity question um but look going back to your question i'm gonna um i promised in the outset just to sort of highlight one or two visual ethnographies um to give a quick glimpse into what they were trying to do so Maharati and the Gandhi question, that was in the late 30s. That was at the same time that Varia Elwin was trying to develop his ethnography of India's Adivasis. And he started with the so-called Baiga community. And um, he used visual arts and photography very effectively in that ethnography uh, to convey a number of different things. Uh, one one element is, of course, the storytelling tradition of the shamanic baigas, as well as the you know significance of myth and memory to that community. And also, he was using a British sculptor, Marguerite Millward, to create insights into the feminine spaces of the uh, baiga community at the time. So, lots of interesting things happening on the visual level in relation to relationships and uh, gender and myth making and so forth so all i wanted to do was just to highlight that varia Elwin was doing this work at this time so through the 1930s and into the 1940s with a view i think to unsettling the colonial preconceptions around india's indigenous and tribal communities and so with that, he became part and parcel of a very clearly Gandhian mindset, a very clearly Gandhian aesthetic. And so a lot of his uh, suggestions kind of pertain to some of those Gandhian values. And that's an interesting kind of intercultural uh, space in and of itself. But one of the reasons why he was doing that was because of the complexity, you could say, of the seemingly the seeming threat of Adivasi uprisings between him and Sarah Chandra Roy, 
and others in the anthropological domain, there was an interesting conversation about this possibility that in the light of Birsamundas Ugulan, in the light of the Santal Rebellion, in the light of these insurgencies, there could be future insurgencies led by Adivasis against injustice. And so this kind of both political and also moral perspective very came very clearly into the view of these um, anthropologists at the time with a view to creating opportunities for reconciliation between communities, which is, of course, part and parcel of that context or culture of solidarity that we were just referring to before. So that was why, one of the reasons why Indian anthropology became what it did, you know, and did what it did was for that search, to develop that search. And so we have ramifications of that after independence. I, I can very, see very clear lines of connection between that ethos and, for example, the writings of Mahaswata Devi and her fascination with um, the, the Adivasi uh, communities in, in West Bengal and Jharkhand and so forth. Um, you know, she wrote this book, Rights to the Forest, by Rana Adhikar, Choti Munda and His Arrow. These are all stories inspired by that Indian anthropology that Sarat Chandra Roy and Elwin and many others were, in, were involved in. The, the colonial viewpoint, though, is, of course, different. And I've written quite a lot about the colonial view on the Santal communities in Jharkhand in the 19th century and the work specifically of one revenue surveyor called Walter Sherwell and his role in visually documenting Santal communities in Jharkhand before the rebellion of 1855 and then also during the rebellion of 1855. He was involved in the counterinsurgency. He was involved in that suppression movement. And with that, of course, comes the execution of Sidhu Murmu. And with that comes the whole kind of trauma, if you like, inflicted upon the Santal communities in terms of their loss uh, and so many uh, Santal kind of, or much Santal heritage work since then has been involved in trying to ascertain Sidhu as a living force, as a living being. And a lot of the statue work that I talked about earlier is an exposition of that theme that Sidhu Murumu is immortal, that he's still living, that he is still an entity in and of himself as a leader of this uh movement for, for social justice um so my final point then is how that happens and the film Hulsengel is 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 worth a, a quick viewing because Rupchand Murmu who's one of the descendants of Sudhu Murmu says it's about what one thing that happened after he was executed um and again you, you might see it through the framework of myth you might see it through the framework of memory. doesn't really matter. What he was saying is that in his view and in the view of his, his family, Sidhu is immortal because evidence of his immortality came through in the light of the, um, the execution and what happened after that. Namely, after the cremation of Sidhu, apparently, according to him, British colonials or some police force shot the ashes of this cremated body and blood flowed out of that uh, cre cre uh, cremated um, entity, in his words, proving Sidhu's immortality. Okay, so that is an, a really powerful and interesting story, if you like, um, because it's it may have literal meaning, it may not. That's not the point. It has social currency. That's the point, because that tells us now, you know, one of the root kind of um, phenomena of this proposition that Sidhu is immortal, that Sidhu has assumed immortality like the Santal deities have, right? So there's a new pantheon now after the rebellion, yeah, after the suppression of the rebellion, after the cremation, after, well, the execution and cremation of, of Sidhu. So that leaves us with lots of important uh, questions about what you were talking about here, the process of memory. Is memory work that's intertwined with a whole belief system, a whole, if you like, worldview or, or cosmo cosmological view that combines now Sidhu Murmu as a leader of the rebellion with all the other deities. Uh, and so then we get, you know, 
insights into what happened in the rebellion and why this kind of um, cosmology matters to Santals in Jharkhand right now. Thank you, sir, for helping us unlearn and relearn coloniality and post-coloniality in this context. Now, as we draw the curtains on today's session, my sincere appreciation goes out to each of our esteemed panelists for offering invaluable insights on the discussed topic. I must say the arguments, propositions were all very well-rounded and well-informed. So before we part ways, a friendly reminder that we are calling for submissions centered around tribal literature and tribal representation in literature, the details of which can be viewed on www.tellmeyourstory.biz. We'll come back to you soon with another engaging panel discussion under the project. Until then, I extend my wishes for a pleasant evening and a very pleasant morning to Dr. Rycroft and to everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.